guys? Okay, so uh, myself and Sam are going to be doing uh, a talk today on how to start creating software products that disrupt the industry you reside in. So for us, it's about disrupt technologies, um, but without changing the entire organization you work in. So this is our journey that we've been through. Um, this is something that me and Sam have kind of come through and we want to kind of relay that to you and tell you what we've learned. So that's what we're doing today. Um, so my name is Josh Nesbitt. I'm Head of Engineering at Covea Digital. Um, previously, I've worked at Lab Bible, uh, Sky and the NHS. At Lab Bible, I built uh, a, a team from scratch, an engineering function from scratch, delivering the next generation publishing platform. Um, at Sky, I led an engineering function to build a framework to build all future Sky products uh, and sites on. Um, and at the NHS, I built a learning platform to allow people to improve their leadership uh, within their role. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of teams, big and small, um, building lots of different types of products. Uh, but mainly I work with teams to build engineering culture and, and process uh, and also using exciting and innovative technologies um, uh, that we'll detail a bit in this talk. Cool. Thanks, Josh. I'm Sam. I'm a tech principal chapter lead, um, formerly head of mobile at two leading Yorkshire agencies. Um, so myself, like Josh, uh, has had a, a small team of, of engineers. But what I've been kind of focusing on throughout my career is managing the ambiguity of emerging technology and how to adopt that um, for businesses and for kind of engineering functions as well. So I've worked with clients like Procter & Gamble, Coty, um, GSK, um, and also made some really fun stuff for the Cartoon Network and the Design Museum as well. So a great span of, of, of new tech and how to manage all of that. And now I'm here at Covey. I've been here since uh, February um, and I've established a, a disruptive chapter here as well. So, Cool. So thanks, Sam. So who's this talk for then, really? Um, it's aimed at a few different kind of demographics, if you will. Um, I'm specifically talking to leaders heads off uh, and CTOs and CTIOs. And then I'm going to be talking to <laughs> you, uh, kind of everybody else really that isn't in that leadership function, um, the product owners, the repressed engineers, the POs, the TEMs, the scrum masters, and the DevOps engineers, the people that will get this work done. Because um, what me and Josh is want to give two different varied views to show how we've shaped this function and how we've delivered it um, from a practical level as well. And yeah, so, uh, you know, with that balance, you know, from my side for, for, for key takeaways for leaders, um, I, I want to kind of say, you know, be bold and be brave. You know, at the end of the day, this is going to be putting your neck on the line a bit. It's going to be disruptive, obviously, um, except that this is going to hurt a little bit. Um, you know, you will have to explain why this process is a little bit painful. Uh, it's going to get in the way of other delivery uh, and priorities. Um, not in the way, but sorry, I don't really mean that, but more that it's going to, it's definitely going to be noticed by a lot of people and you need to be able to stand up the team that are trying to deliver this. So it is going to disrupt the, uh, the organization. And most importantly, you know, you've got to let these amazing people, these amazing engineers that you've hired um, do their best work. Uh, and ultimately, um, you know, you don't want them to be doing mediocre work, but, you know, they are creative people and they need to be able to thrive in an environment like this. <clears throat> And I want to be talking to the, you know, the key, the key takeaways for engineers and everybody else really is communicate your activity, but don't overshare. Make people aware of what you're doing so that it doesn't become like a silent secret function, uh, but don't give away too many secrets because otherwise everybody will want a piece of it. Um, find the naysayers and the people that you'll find that will challenge you throughout this and embrace them. And that sounds like quite a difficult thing to do. But when you're in an established sort of like enterprise level um, engineering function, there'll be lots of different opinions and lots of different experiences that people would have had. Some of those people might be able to bring and expedite some of the uh, activity that you're going to try and achieve. So find them, embrace them. Um, and also from a, from a kind of delivery perspective, create high fidelity prototypes. It might take a little bit more time, but that will really help get buy in from the product from product and from the business. Um, <clears throat> if you create something that's so vanilla and so technical, you're going to lose interest straight away. So you're trying to almost like resell the technology back to your business. And what we wanted to do before we go into it is kind of break down the nine months since I joined um, as the kind of chapter lead of the uh, the tech principles and, and the disruptive chapter just to highlight how how we've done it and then the next slides after that will detail some of the kind of key touch points in which we've uh, delivered on so 
Uh, the leadership team employed myself to lead the chapter and gave me a challenge and that challenge was to look at um, the identification of watches using computer vision. What we had to do was present that results to the exec board and that was my first opportunity to, to speak to a sort of like a high profile audience in the business and I think that was almost like a test to see whether this function and chapter would work well because ultimately if we get buy-in from the board that means that we can get buy-in from everyone else across the business. As a result of that, we were given a real challenge. I think that first one was almost like the test, like I just said. And in order to deliver that challenge, what we asked for quite differently in terms of resource and the engineers, we wanted volunteers to join us on this journey because it was almost like an attitude shift. We had to manage some very ambiguous statements around the technology that we're about to embark on, the, the delivery opportunity of it, the benefits of the technology. So we wanted people with the right mindset to join us. Um, so that was one of the key points. In July and August, we hit so many challenges um, from the technology that we was using, from the processes that we had in the business. This was a real tough month for us uh, as, a, as, as a chapter. But we once once we've got through that barrier, we ended up delivering our solution as promised. Um, and then we've built trust in the business. And I think that's the key thing for our, all of this. It's taken us a lot of time but we've built the trust in the business from an exec level to the business level and now the requests for our disruptive activity are kind of flying in. But before we go into the details of how we've delivered that, I think it's important for Josh just to, just to reiterate the foundations of disruption from an engineering function. Yeah, so we know the, the kind of triangle of disruption looks like looks like this. So on, on, the, on the bottom layer, we've got the day-to-day, -day, the BAU stuff. You know, as a, as a company, we need to sell and maintain policies with our affinity partners. So for us on the bottom, uh, the bottom tier, we have to always keep the lights on. Um, the second tier really is about delivery of, of new products uh, and, and delivery for us of our insurance as a service platform. And then the top tier really is the disruptive projects and technologies um, for us. So, um, you know, kind of enabling that team um, that we have inside of Kavaya to go uh, uh, and, and take the initiative to try and uh, run with these disruptive projects um, that we can then spread to the wider organization. Um, ultimately, uh, as Indiana's uh, showing here, you know, it is a bit of a balancing act. Um, you know, how do we fade out legacy systems and allow disruptive technologies to define how we can build better experiences for our customer? Um, so, you know, it's not always a clean swap out like in this, this GIF, but, you know, ultimately we do need to try and focus on how we can build disruptive um, technology that can help lead our insurance platform. So, Josh, as we are about to detail this sort of like disruptive and principal chapter, do you think it was a coincidence or it was the grand panel along that we deployed the principles before disruption and there was a leader? Um, I just thought it might be a good way to explain that for, for our audience. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to say it was planned completely all along. I think it's a nice mixture of both, really. Um, ultimately, we hired some fantastic people. Um, so as you can see on the left here, um, you know, the principal chapter, the role of a principal really is to take that expert knowledge that they've, they've had over time um, and to help support the tribe with that. So, you know, help the, the leads, the senior developers um, to, to run their own, uh, their own squads. Uh, and then also to feed that into disruptive engineering. So all of the experience and technology um, that, that, you know, the principals have used um, helped to uh, deliver some disruptive projects with that knowledge. Um, so, yeah, it's a cyclical process, um, but that's what we expect of our principles. Um, ultimately, the, the makeup of our principal chapter um, happens to be absolutely awesome. Um, so we have, you know, a back end principal, a node, a front end, a data and a full stack principal, which really makes it for me a kind of dream team to deliver this sort of project, really, you know, disruptive project where we can kind of set a task and, and kind of trust them to get on with that um, and not to interfere too much. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess um, really for me, it's about that handover really. So um, moving on to the kind of next slide, deploying a principal chapter to me means handing over the reins, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, we define guardrails to ensure that they stay true to engineering, but also don't micromanage them. You know, as I said, we have a fantastic team. Uh, ultimately, it's about letting them get on and do their best work uh, without interfering too much. Yeah. And then really it's for me, uh, as that technical principal chapter lead to take that new chapter and ships um, and remove the barriers to engineering and fix the broken bridges of the past. Because when I embarked on this role, 
um, I was faced with a number of different challenges about how some of the activity that we were going to embark on has already been done before. People could have told me about it two years ago or they could have told me about the old innovation squad and nothing came of it um, or whether the, the the product road whether the product roadmap is already established and what what we're trying to achieve won't be delivered until till 2022 really what I want to kind of um, reiterate here is you should if you're faced with these re-challenge uh, reframe every challenge and bring those naysayers on board so those people that have told you about something that they could have told you about years ago um, take that person and use their expertise because they might be able to help you create the proof of concept that you need. The old innovation squad that came of it, I don't want to ignore that. I kind of want to learn from the mistakes of the past. So let's, so let's book a session and let's find out, was it the way in which they delivered something? Was it the technology that they created? Was it the way in which they communicated to the business? I really want to learn from that. And also, without the demo, you won't know about the art of the possible, so therefore you won't know whether it will fit into the product roadmap until you've seen it. So that's a really key thing for me when I took this kind of role on was to meet those people and reframe every challenge that I got. And I think it's more of a, not a technical delivery, it's a bit of a mindset change. But also another mindset change as well as if you're going to do something like this is becoming aware of yourself, your social surroundings, because we want to build fast and fail fast and we've got to move fast so really we've got to be aware of myself in my function and show my peers that i really care because really what might happen is that product might not like the curveball that they've not planned but i've shown something to the business um, delivery might find my commitment to the execs doesn't meet any plan that they've ever thought about but also more importantly to us as an engineering function my fellow engineers and your fellow engineers might think why not me and become discouraged and i think there's not an immediate answer to this i think you've got to kind of have this mindset if you're going to embark on this work is that as josh said right at the start of the presentation it will hurt and some of these areas is where it's hurt the most where i found challenges where people have been saying why are you doing this and why is this happening but ultimately once we've got the buy-in from the senior stakeholders i know what i've got to do from for you know showing integrity to the business i'm delivering something that meets their needs Another thing that's uh, talking about being bold um, is one of the things that we did was with the audience that we had, um, I presented a timeline which is probably unheard of in sort of like enterprise engineering because of the sort of like the level of process that we have in the business. And I said that we would deliver something within eight weeks. Um, now, it is a bit bold um, and I think it is one of those situations where it's, you know, a time to be bold is, you know, be bold, but don't continuously do it because people will lose faith in you. Um, so I did say something to the execs. What that did do is it sparked a flame, which has ignited a bit of a fire in the business to show that we can move fast. Um, whether or not we did deliver on that timing specifically is one thing, but actually we have moved faster in this project than any others. Because really we knew that the process, the engineering work, was the easy part. We'd almost done all of that. Um, and the analogy of the wheel that needed breaking, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, is that sort of like looking at everything else around something to say, how can we bring DevOps in faster? How can we bring um, information security in faster? Because they'll have their own processes and they weren't part of this function. So that's what we tried to do at this point. And really, yeah, from, yeah go on, sorry, Josh. No, go on, Sam. Well, I was going to say, you know, from there, I think I'd kind of landed the head of engineering in it with me um, because ultimately my 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 statement brought it all to life. So we're in it together. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I think I think, you know, that, that it did it did definitely start a fire, but in, in, a, in quite a good way. You know, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to illustrate the business, the art of the possible. Uh, and we don't have to move so slowly with some of this disruptive tech. So for me, I trusted Sam to, to, to deliver on his, his promise. Okay, is Sam going to stay eight weeks in front of the board again? Maybe not, who knows? Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think you know, we've got to stick with it. You know, I trust Sam to deliver on that and I trust uh, him to lead the engineers to deliver uh, on everything we've shown already. So yeah, trust the team, um, deal with any sort of chasing that may occur from execs, try and insulate the team so they can do their best work. Uh, and still don't micromanage. You know, at the end of the day, they know what they're doing. They're cracking on with this. They have a goal. Leave them to it and try and insulate them and let them get on with it. Yeah. 
Now, I think it would be remiss of us um, to not show anything that we've done, having talked about in this lightning talk about the disruptive activity that we've completed. So this is an example of um, one of the ways in which engineering were given autonomy to deliver a challenge, um, which, which as a result of COVID-19, the business had to react and respond very quickly. So this, as you can see on the GIF, um, there's a very simple interface that's allowing people to check in and out of uh, a site. So, <coughs> excuse me, we have three locations across the country. Um, and what we needed to do was move really fast on this and use use the tools that are around us. So it uses uh, Microsoft Power Apps and it uses uh, D365 for easy staff integration and user management. That's really important because what we don't want to do is create a system that means we have to keep creating profiles. If we can integrate with something that's already part of the business, that'll really help us move this forward faster. As I've mentioned, <coughs> There's multiple locations, there's multiple floor capacity. The manager gets notified if a floor is at capacity as a result of the output of the application. Um, there's a date and timestamp for auditing as well. So again, this was just given to us as a challenge to say, can you tackle this? Because we're looking at options around us. Do we build or buy? And it's those big questions. This was made in rapid time and it was used across the business and now it's being expanded on. And I think it's a great example of just being given autonomy to move really fast. The second example is is, is the high fidelity um, prototypes that I mentioned earlier. As you'll see in the video that's being played, this is showing some of the um, optical character recognition technology that we've been using to kind of identify and um, process some of our no claims bonus proof. So what this is showing actually is it shows that another example of the engineering capabilities when left alone. No UX input, no design input. It guides the users through with development notes to reinforce the key messages. I think that's really important. You know, we've got really, 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 really intelligent engineers that have got opinions about how to use technology, but also this output shows and brings to life the raw output of the technology. Where actually, that was some of the things that was hung on to the most, saying, I can't believe this computer vision could pick up my watch. I can't believe it can pick up items in my house. Whereas engineers on our side are going, we've told you about this all along. And I think that's really, really key to say, actually, look at the future capabilities of this technology that we're presenting to you now, because that's when you can start asking engineering of the functions and the potential product roadmap of the future. <coughs> and actually, it's what's under the hood that matters when you get into production. So all of that high fidelity prototyping that we created to kind of build momentum on the activity that we're trying to achieve doesn't look as sexy when you deliver it as a function in the business. But this is what it actually looks like to increase and improve efficiently of, a, of an existing process. So currently what happens when we request um, proof of no claims, uh, uh, an agent reads that information in a very manual process. Our high fidelity prototype allows us to show how technology can read a document on your behalf. We've taken that into this and now we connect our cloud OCR service to take any document and read it. It connects to the customer profile and scans and then references against key criteria. And those visual indicators helps agents um, process information much faster. This process takes on average about six minutes per user as a result of the processes that we have, as a result of some of the legacy systems, legacy systems that we've got. This process that I'm showing you now reduces up to 30 seconds. So without us showing some of those out of the possible examples from earlier, the business would never have asked for a solution like this. And this is a real great output of our disruptive portfolio because this is not just, hey, let's have a look at this technology. This is this technology will improve processes throughout the business and this is how we're going to do it. And this was an absolute lightning talk from myself and Josh about our journey from embarking on disruptive activity from the very start. Um, I currently can't see who's in the in the room. But I'm just kind of opening the floor to questions now about how we've tackled some of our activity. I think it's only me. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Embarrassingly, I actually thought that this was going to be more about risk engineering than on the like programming engineering side. But nonetheless, um, I think it's really great to understand the kind of details behind how you get some of your digital projects 
off the ground um, and very different from how I've heard other kind of carriers doing it and it's nice to know that you do actually have a background of people that don't come from the insurance world as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think you know, in a lot of um, different sectors and certainly in kind of agencies, um, this sort of stuff will seem like common sense because, you know, you don't have to think so much about how you would disrupt um, the status quo really, whereas obviously in, in, in insurance and a lot of bigger industries, especially ones that are regulated, um, you know, it's a lot more difficult to move fast on these things. So, yeah, it's certainly something that's a bit more challenging. I don't, okay. have, any, I don't have any questions, unfortunately. It's, it's all right. Thank <laughs> you very okay. much. It's all good. Thanks for coming there. I appreciate it. Yeah, really appreciate your time.